Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, which is webinar number two of three in our online marketing series. If you missed the first webinar, you can hear it on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash printing industries one. So that's printing with the capital P, industries with the capital I, and then the number one. As I mentioned, this is webinar number two of three, and if you are interested in attending webinar number three, it will be held on November the 14th, so make sure to mark that down in your diaries. In today's webinar, we will be learning about content and what role it can play in building a relationship with our online customers. We'll also be covering online marketing strategies that suit your company and industry, and that are of course in line with your wider marketing strategy and your business objectives. Once again, our presenter is Mr. Chris Fell, who is the Managing Director and Founder of G2M Solutions, which is Australia's leading inbound marketing company. Chris has extensive international and domestic experience working in areas such as market research, B2B marketing, and business training and consulting. Chris is also well versed in IP and technology tools and how they can be successfully implemented uh, in helping to create uh, an online marketing strategy. So that's all there is for me. I will now hand you over to Chris so that he can start his presentation. Hello everyone um, and a very, very good afternoon to you all. I'm uh, really excited to be here for, as uh, Yoshi was saying, the, the second in, in our series of uh, three in, uh, in online um, marketing. And uh, about a month ago or so, we, we, we talked about um, the buyer and the changes that were that the were, un, were being under, were undergoing in the in the buyer's world and how uh, that meant that us as marketers and as owners of businesses have to really change and step up to the plate and change our own approach to how we engage with them. Um, and one of the messages that uh, I left you with last time was that uh, the, one of the core ways in which we want to engage with. Uh, with buyers in this new world is through the use of content and that's really what we're going to focus on today is um, you know what is content marketing is it really uh, uh, being used a lot in Australia and particularly how you might go about building a plan for uh, for content marketing and then and then executing against that plan so that's what we're going to focus on today um, and you know I think that the, that the background to all of this really is that um, B2B lead generation I think we all would would agree is is really getting a lot tougher than it has been uh, uh, in the past, and uh, in for many of us, the old tactics that we're used to using are simply not working very well anymore, and they're not creating the, the quantity of the leads that we want, which is clearly bad. But I think also the quality of the leads that we're getting from our old marketing tactics are quite poor as well, and this is really putting quite a imposition on the sales and marketing function in terms of how much it costs versus how much revenue that sales and marketing function can earn. So as I mentioned to you, we're going to spend some time talking today about uh, content marketing. And just before we get into it, I just I guess wanted to kind of reverse up the road a wee bit and, and, and refresh our memories on some of the things we talked about on the last webinar about, you know, what's the background to this? Why is content seeing such a renaissance that it is right now. Um, and there's a fair bit of research out there um, being done by a lot of uh, market research companies around how the buyer's decision-making process is changing. I just thought it'd be useful um, to share some of that information with you. And what we're really starting to see now is what we call the emergence of this sort of self-service buyer, i.e. Rather than, than buyers historically relying on, you know, often long-term relationships with their suppliers, is these buyers are uh, on online, they're, they're on, um, uh, getting online on the, on the web, um, searching in Google and Yahoo and Bing and all the other search engines and self-serving and they're starting to uncover a lot of information for themselves and not requiring the assistance of their uh, suppliers in order to do that. And you can see here in this little orange box on the left-hand side, some data from um, Forrester, very well respected uh, market intelligence firm, and uh, they, their research is telling them that around 85% of B2B buyers are starting their buying journey online. Now in the green box, there's some data from uh, another smart outfit called DemandGen, 
And they're saying that they're seeing 78% of B2B buyers starting their buying journey directly on a company website. So of course what that means is, you know, you really better be ranking on Google on that first page of Google or um, you know, those buyers are just not going to find their way to, to your website. But I think this third box at the bottom here, 60%, um, on average, customers will contact a sales rep after they've independently completed 60% of the purchase process. I think in many ways this is the most telling of all three of these statistics because what this is really telling you is not only are buyers initially engaging online, which I think you know, anecdotally we all kind of understand that. We certainly spend a lot of time ourselves uh, online looking for stuff. But these people are going much deeper into their buying journey than simply that initial engagement. And they're actually completing a significant proportion of the buying journey and making decisions about who they want to buy from way before they're even contacting a sales rep in the first place. And this, of course, has significant implications for the marketing department, right? Because now it's marketing's job to kind of fill that gap and make sure that they're exerting influence over the buyer in that, you know, two-thirds, pretty much, of their entire buying journey. So we're in this era of the buyer, and as we said, just said, you know, today's buyers, they're really in this, in this process of... Uh, grazing on this diet of content that they're finding online and uh, it's around the problems that they're encountering in their business and they're reading and consuming this information to help them make um, the right purchasing decision. So the corollary of this is that increasingly buyers are having much lower engagement with what we would call interruption based marketing tactics. So you know emails jamming up their inbox at a time and place when they're not particularly interested in, in, in talking about purchasing something or learning about how to purchase something. And as you'd expect, what's happening is that buyers are finding much more sophisticated, sophisticated techniques for, um, for blocking out these unwanted messages. And we're seeing this, of course, uh, across many, many mediums. Um, we're seeing it in the business world, you know, spam filters, we've got your home phone and work phone. You've got, you know, do not call, caller ID on your phone. I guess, um, I don't know about you, but, you know, most of us won't even answer a, a call anymore on your mobile from a blocked number. So, uh, and of course, on TV, you're seeing uh, a lot of people consuming uh, TV content um, by buying content on things like iTunes or rec recording it on Foxtel IQ and devices like that, which allow them to skip through ads um, and, and, uh, and avoid those uh, irritating messages that uh, interrupt your viewing pleasure. So um, we're really seeing quite a different, uh, I guess, environment emerging for the marketer in order to, uh, to try and wield influence over the buyer. And what this is all boiling down to is that the challenge for B2B marketers now is it's really up to us to attract buyers to us rather than uh, the pushing and interrupting uh, buyers. Um, you know, content is really becoming a critical tool in um, the marketer's arsenal of weapons. And um, you know, obviously the, the main job here is to get found by buyers who are online and then engage with them uh, and deepen that engagement before you actually have the, uh, you've earned the right to speak with them. In other words, your sales team have, um, have earned the right to, to speak with them and to sell to them. So I guess one early question is exactly how far down this content marketing path is um, the Australian marketing uh, community? Are we saying that content marketing is really on the bleeding edge or are we really well on the way to using content marketing in our everyday marketing tactics. And what this um, chart here is attempting to do, let me just get this out of your way. Um, is showing you some data from um, a piece of local research that was undertaken just recently in about March 2013 uh, Content Marketing Institute and, and ADMA, which is a local Australian uh, marketing association, 
uh, just a few months ago, and they were looking at uh, content marketing in Australia, um, benchmarks, budgets, and trends. And if you look first at um, the orange boxes there, this is a series of questions really around, you know, how, how, um, how many people are actually engaging in content marketing? And the answer is almost everybody. 96% of B2B firms are using content. Uh, interestingly, uh, three quarters of them are distributing that content on LinkedIn. And on average, on average, 12 pieces of content are being used by, uh, by marketers to uh, content pieces are being used to attract buyers. We look now to the green boxes on the right-hand side here. Um, exactly how much are people spending on content marketing? Well, as it turns out, around a quarter um, of marketing budget is being spent on content, and that's only going to go up. As you can see, uh, two-thirds of those surveyed plan to increase their budget uh, in 2014. So it's already a quarter, and it's getting larger. And then the blue boxes on the left-hand side there is really talking about, you know, what are people using content marketing for? What's the main objective for content marketing? And 73% are being used to build awareness, so that, I guess, top of funnel initial engagement. 56% of them are using content to subsequently engage uh, with those buyers. And then 29% of them are, taking, are using content to take buyers deep into the relationship and nurture those leads to a point which they're ready to, to engage with sales. I think, you know, really these last three points here are probably the most interesting in many ways, because this is really telling us that content is being used across the whole funnel. It's not just at that initial engagement. It's really being used to pull, to engage, and then pull leads deep into, um, into, the, into, the, uh, into the buying engagement. So, how are we going to do this? How, how do we uh, advise our clients to go about building uh, a content marketing approach? And you know, pretty much whenever we work with a client, we, we insist that everybody starts with building a plan uh, and a process before we start uh, deciding how to and what to execute. And, and our own uh, methodology calls for this six-step process. Um, the first one is, first two in fact, we discussed in a fair amount of detail in the last session. So as Yoshi said, if you'd, if you'd like to, to understand this, these first two tasks of defining personas and um, uh, what questions do your personas ask, you can certainly um, take a look at that uh, first presentation we gave, and you'll get to see that in a lot more detail. That's really the foundation for a lot of this work that we subsequently do with content, is making sure that you're building on really solid foundations. Uh, understanding who your buyers are, and I'm not talking about market segments, I'm talking about individuals. Who are the buyer personas who actually make the purchase decision? And what questions are they asking themselves at each stage of their buying process? So quite clearly, when you're very at the very, very early stages of buying something, you're really in a completely different mindset, and after you've got a whole bunch of different questions, and you're after a whole different bunch of information to uh, educate yourself about what your choices might be compared to, say, the very last uh, stage before you, you make the purchasing decision when you're evaluating, say, two or three potential vendors. Clearly, those questions that you're asking yourself right at the end of the buying journey are more around, you know, are these guys price competitive? Uh, are they a reputable organization? Is the product or service that they provide going to solve my problem? So quite different questions. So the third step, then, is really around uh, an audit uh, of what it is that you've already got, what content do you already have inside of your organization. Um, and, and often you might think to yourself, well, I can't really use this piece of content to market with, but perhaps if you look at it through new eyes and say, well, if perhaps if I just edited it a little bit, that would actually be a very useful piece of content that I could share uh, in my marketing. So a great example might be you know, a PowerPoint presentation which uh, someone in your, in your company is used to, as an internal education piece to keep everyone up to speed with what's going on. Without too much trouble, that could probably be used and converted into an external piece that you could share with potential buyers. So don't forget um, that sometimes there's, there's a lot more content sitting around the organization that you might than you might initially think. So then uh, task number four, of course, is mapping that content that you've currently got available to the questions 
that you've come up with um, uh, when you're doing your persona research. Uh, step five is you're not going to have everything, so it's a question of establishing the gaps then. Uh, where's the content we've got that's missing? And of course, step six then is to fill those gaps by creating content. So uh, a, a reasonably straightforward six-step process. And then part two of this is um, you know, probably a spreadsheet is the best uh, tool to use. Um, create something that looks like this. So you will have an inventory of content that you start with. Uh, a series of buyer personas that you have identified, maybe two or three. In this particular case, we've got three. So this might be, let's say, um, I want to, persona A is the CIO of an organization, and persona B might be the CFO of an organization. So they've got quite different needs. The first one is much more around technical. The second persona is much more around return on investment and purchase um, justification. So quite different requirements. And then you look at the different stages of the buyer's journey, the early stage, the mid stage, and the late stage, and you try and map all the content pieces that you've got against each one of those stages. What you kind of end up with is something that looks a little bit like this. Um, you've got your, your content map effectively, a, um, a, a funnel of relevant content to feed each one of those different personas that we've got up on the screen there. So you've got persona one, as we said, let's say that's the IT manager. Uh, on the early stage content, um, we might have identified a blog post or a series of blog posts that that person might be interested in. Um, that might lead them to a piece of mid-funnel content, which is perhaps a, an e-book, um, which they can download and read in a little bit more detail about, uh, about that particular challenge. Um, and then further down in the funnel, you might have a series of emails that get sent out to them to, uh, to perhaps ask for uh, a meeting for a salesperson, and so on and so forth. And you have slightly different content for Persona 2 and Persona 3. That's um, a quick whistle-stop tour through, I guess, how to build a content map and a content plan. Um, but planning, of course, uh, we only doing planning for one reason, and that is, uh, of course, executing. So now we're going to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about that. And um, okay, so you've got your beautiful, shiny new plan. Uh, now what are you going to do? And, uh, and our pretty much consistent advice across uh, every single engagement we have with, uh, with our clients is you must appoint uh, an internal editor. And it doesn't have to be somebody who's full-time. It has to be somebody's job to make sure that this um, uh, content calendar that you've created uh, is being adhered to, the organization has been kept on track, um, that there is a calendar, and, and perhaps you know, one point here to, 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 to make is you've really got to make sure you've got buy-in from the boss. And the one thing that, uh, that we see over and over again is people think of content as, as like a typical campaign. We're going to do it for a quarter, and then we're going to stop and see what happens. And that doesn't work with content. Content is really a commitment not a campaign, and we always say to people you should have a, a commitment and money and an inclination and resources to pursue a content campaign for a good 12 months. Second point here is uh, it's very, very easy to fail to fuel your content engine. Um, it's very, very time consuming, or can be very, very time consuming. So you, know, you really got to make sure you share the load uh, amongst your internal experts, um, and that, of course, is uh, your own creating your own content. Um, but also, don't forget that there are an awful lot of external specialists out there. Um, there's thought leaders who don't work for your firm, um, but are very well-respected people in the industry. Perhaps you work with some technology partners in your firm. And of course, you've all got customers. And they are, they are sometimes the best um, advocates for yourself and for creating content. Or content. Uh, we call that curating content rather than creating content. And uh, what we see is, on average, our recommendation is around 30% of your own content to 70% of curated content. Why is that good? Because in many cases, um, what Google and the other search engines really like to see um, is you being kind of a, a destination or a hub of interesting, uh, helpful advice and content on a particular topic, so people um, see you as a, a kind of a, a a source of expertise, um, and so uh, 
not just creating all your own content, but also curating others is a great way to achieve that. Final piece of advice, um, which we see again is a, a common mistake that lots and lots of people make is, is don't um, you know, try and do bits and pieces of two or three personas content maps. If in doubt, start small and do one complete content map for, for that persona. You're much better off doing, doing one properly than trying to resource two or three different um, persona content funnels and, and kind of doing all of them badly. Second part is, you know, once you've, um, you've built your content, I mean, it's taken an, you a lot of time and energy and money uh, to build, you really want to make sure you're maximizing the return you're going to get on that investment by distributing your content far and wide. So, um, you know, a lot of people ask say to us, well, surely, you know, email marketing, that's not, that's not online, you know, that's outbound marketing. And, uh, you know, we're quick to say, well, look, out email is still the most effective channel um, uh, for uh, delivering content to, to your buyers, but if and only if the contact already knows you. And this, this is where I think there's a lot of um, challenge around email marketing is people who are buying lists and blasting out emails to people who they have very little right to market to, um, if not in a legal sense, then certainly you know, that, that the person receiving the email really doesn't know you. Why on earth would they open your email, which is hence why those you know, unsolicited email open rates are often below 1%. So very, very uh, ineffective if they don't know you. Blogging, um, turns out that it's one of the most uh, effective tools you can use in terms of distributing your content. But I would make the point that it does require some commitment to do that. Uh, but it's a really excellent tool. Um, and also, uh, the search engines really, really like blogging. Every time you post a blog, it's like having a new page on your website. Um, and you get a lot of uh, you know, Google juice uh, for having a blog, and it really, really helps with your search rankings. Uh, social media, uh, again, an excellent way of uh, engaging literally one-on-one -on -one with people who are, for example, on LinkedIn. Um, I guess like a word of caution is, again, uh, Make sure the channel is suitable for your sector. Uh, for, for many, many B2B businesses, Facebook is um, marginal at best, uh, for example, whereas LinkedIn, I would say, is pretty much compulsory for everyone to, uh, to get involved in that. Uh, Pay-per-click advertising uh, can work well. This is a great way of uh, you know, putting banners uh, out there. Uh, you, you're obviously paying um, someone like Google, for example, or LinkedIn. Um, to put your your uh, your tile on a place where lots of people are, are visiting, uh, costs money of course and can be very expensive, but it's it's certainly faster than building a lot of that visibility uh, organically. So it can work well um, if used uh, with a degree of caution. And the final point is, you know, don't forget that um, pretty much every business partners with somebody. Um, there are influencers out there in the marketplace. There are journalists, there are guest bloggers, there are people at industry associations um, who are strong influencers in the market, and of course your customers. You know, your customers can be your, your, your best advocates. And a really, really obvious example of that is you know, a case study or a testimonial as a piece of content um, is a tremendously powerful because it's your customer actually advocating uh, your, your company's uh, products or services. So why are we doing all of this content? Well, um, I think for the vast majority of us, the reason we're spending all this time and effort to generate content is to generate leads. So it's really important um, to always, always have a call to action in your content. What we hate to see when we're putting together these campaigns for our clients is these dead ends, you know, where, where uh, someone reads uh, a blog or they read a LinkedIn post and, and that's it. There's nowhere else to go. There's no, nothing to link on, nothing to click to, um, no other content to download. So we always like to uh, ensure that the content has call to action at the end of it. Um, what we also think works extremely well is uh, put your high value content, and by that I mean, for example, something like a white paper or an ebook um, behind a form on a landing page, and then ask your contacts for uh, their details in order to to get access to this content. And obviously, for, some, for someone to be prepared to give away their details, 
that content has to be genuinely valuable. So it's not going to work if it's a, you know, it's a, a 30 second video or a 90 second video. Um, someone's not going to, you know, register um, their contact information to have a look at that. Whereas, as you have guys have done today, to access something which you perceive as, as being valuable, you're more than happy to give away your contact details uh, in order to consume that content. Um, what we suggest to clients, though, is you know, really try and keep the amount of information you ask for at that initial engagement as light as you possibly can. I mean, literally, first name, last name, email, perhaps company name as well. Try and avoid asking for phone number because that probably puts people off more than anything else because they think they're going to get a call from a sales guy. So later on, um, when you've engaged with these people and they know you and trust you, by all means, you can ask for a greater level of, inf uh, of details in the, on the forms that you have on your website. You can get a lot more information um, and because uh, you've earned that right. Final point is um, a consistent theme. If you listen to, to, to these webinars, you'll hear this being mentioned over and over again. Uh, whatever you do, you should measure what is and also what isn't working. And um, you know, be prepared to get it wrong. And um, no one ever gets it right first time. So experimenting is a good thing. Um, the only way you know if your experiments worked is by measuring it. Um, so having a, a clear and consistent way of measuring content is extremely important. So we often get asked this question, OK, Chris, so what type of content is best? You know, what, what content should we, should we use? What's going to guarantee us results? And unfortunately, the question is, um, it really depends. And uh, what we found is, you know, across different industries that we work in, uh, every industry has its preference. And, um, it's really a question of figuring out for your own sector through experimentation and measurement is, you know, what works, what do people like, um, what, what triggers the, the highest level of engagement. A couple of general comments which I think uh, always, always hold true is that quality, helpful, educative content is always going to beat boring stuff about you and how great your products and services are. You know, the trouble is you think your products and services are incredibly interesting uh, and, uh, and important, but almost all of your buyers would probably take a different view. Um, uh, and so it's really important to make sure whatever you're writing is is aimed to help your buyer um, with, their, with their purchasing decision. A couple of other things I think we would all recognize now that our t time is at such an incredible premium that uh, shorter is better. And also I think you know, people are getting really, really used to seeing a lot of video. Um, uh, and so visual is, is almost certainly better. Uh, there's a lot of content marketing being delivered by video these days. Um, one thing I would say, is even good old-fashioned things like you know white papers it's definitely worth investing money in in creating some visual punch in your content there is so much information out there there's a real you know content overload and the question is really you know if that's the situation how do you cut through this incredible amount of information that's out there and spending a little bit of money with you know, creative individuals to really understand how to make something look good um, and have impact, or it's presented in an interesting way, or uh, something like that, is uh, is well worth it, and, and gives you just uh, gives you the edge when um, when you're uh, you know competing for eyeballs. Final little tip on this is um, we call this atomizing. So one of the things we recommend our clients do is that they put their effort and energy into a couple of central high-value content pieces. An example would be an ebook. So you know, a lot of effort and energy goes into it. It might be, you know, 15 to 20 pages, nicely laid out. It's taken a significant amount of effort to produce it. Make sure when you're planning that out that you're also thinking about how can I break that up into lots of little pieces. So I might have, let's say, an ebook with seven or eight chapters. Make sure that I write seven or eight blogs, or I design seven or eight blogs that come out of those seven or eight chapters. That I've got a, an email campaign that perhaps sends out a series of emails that promotes different findings in that ebook, that type of thing. Uh, and by doing that, you get, uh, I guess, a bigger bang for your buck. So what are some of the challenges with, uh, with content marketing? And you know, we, uh, you know, we're running content campaigns for clients all the time. And I think one of the things that, that consistently we hear is uh, a lot of people um, start content marketing campaigns and they fail after three months. You know, all the best intentions in the world, 
um, uh, fall uh, to one side and uh, your blog grinds to a halt after you know the first couple of months. And um, from that study that I was uh, sharing with you earlier, uh, here's some other data points. So 51%, so over half of all the Australian firms that were surveyed cited a lack of time as being a major reason why content marketing uh, fails. Also, um, there's a lack of skills, uh, writing skills. So I think you know, we're all very used to writing uh, you know, business emails and, and you know, internal reports and recommendations, really considerably different skill set to, uh, uh, to writing for your buyer. And even writing a blog post requires completely different skill sets to writing uh, a script for a video, for example. So there's a lot of um, uh, challenges there for organizations to provide compelling, interesting um, uh, words um, for their content. Um, and then many, many firms struggle to produce enough content over a, a period of time, so across the full funnel and across the full buying cycle. And of course, the corollary of that, as you'd expect, is that um, you know nearly two thirds of firms, small and medium-sized firms, are looking to outsourcing, and pretty much all of the very large Australian firms um, outsource, if not all, then a significant chunk of their content marketing. There's an awful lot of journalists out there with uh, with no jobs anymore, and um, or at least struggling to to earn a living. And uh, they're excellent writers, got tremendously good uh, content marketing skills, and uh, you know our strong recommendation would be to uh, to engage with them. So just to, um, to wrap up now, we're just uh, over the half hour mark. Um, here are some of our uh, steps to success. First and foremost, um, make sure that you don't fall into content marketing, that you make a specific, active, definitive decision to start content marketing, uh, that you allocate budgets, you allocate time resources and financial resources um, to it. It is a commitment, it's not a campaign, uh, and ensure that the boss is on side. Because at the end of the day, uh, you know, we don't want uh, your content campaign to have the budget cut just as you're getting going. Uh, planning properly is absolutely crucial. Uh, you've got to make sure that whatever content marketing map you come up with is clearly aligned to your buyer personas and the different stage of their buyer's journey. Uh, writing for your buyer personas is definitely a skill set and most of us are very, very comfortable writing about our own company and our own products and services and a lot less comfortable writing about buyers and um, what they're interested in. So it definitely requires reworking the messaging in most of your content to make sure that it reflects the buyers and the, the, the world in which they live. We talked about tailoring content uh, to specific buyer personas and being very focused about that. Um, make sure you get the maximum bang for your buck, distributing content on LinkedIn, um, making sure you're committing to resources. It really is a brand promise. There is nothing worse than going to a website and seeing a blog that's been going for two or three months and then you look at the, the last time something was posted and it was like six months ago. It's a really bad look. Um, we advocate being agile in your content marketing, being open and acknowledging the fact that you're definitely not going to get it right first time. It's very important to change stuff, try new things, be prepared to fail. Um, and then the last point, um, and probably is, and we think anyway, the, the most important of all is you've really got to make sure that you measure and analyze everything that you do, change what doesn't work and re-measure it. And that's probably the best way to achieving some consistent success over time. The final slide here is, um, I guess, uh, a graphic which we had in the last deck as well, which is our own um, methodology for online lead and revenue generation. And you can see on the left-hand side here um, how we convert strangers to visitors, visitors to leads, leads to customers, and customers to promoters. And the, the only point I want to leave you with here is that you know, a lot of people think content's about that very left-hand gray circle about how do I attract a stranger and turn them into a visitor. Our point is that you know, content, if you think about it, is really a key element. It's a strand that's woven through every one of these stages. It's not simply a, a top of funnel engagement tactic. It's really important um, connecting strand from uh, that initial attraction of visitors right through to the point of revenue and even beyond. 
So those are the end of my, um, I guess, formal comments. Um, I guess now it's time to, uh, to take any questions from, uh, from the people on the webinar. Over to you, Yoshi. Thank you, Chris. So yes, if you do have any questions, please feel free to type them into the questions box and I will, of course, read them out for you. Uh, so while we're waiting for that, I've just got a quick question about the blogs and I was just wondering, is there any kind of rule of thumb about how often you should post a blog or how long it should be or anything along those lines? Yeah, so you know, blog, as I mentioned, blogging is an incredibly uh, useful tactic um, and one that has all sorts of benefits. Uh, over and above simply the obvious one of, uh, of publishing the content. Um, once a week is really, I think it's the minimum uh, for, doing, for doing blogging. There's a lot of evidence that shows that blogging two to three times a week significantly improves your traffic, but um, that is also a significant increase in effort. So, you know, um, I guess treat that one with a bit of caution, but there is an absolutely positive correlation between the number of times you blog and the number of visitors you drive to your site. And also, blogging um, kind of creates um, mass, you know, it kind of creates momentum as well. It, you, can, you can have a blog that you published, you know, a year ago, and if it's a good blog, people will still be finding it and accessing it and reading it. So it really is a, it's kind of gift that gives on giving. Um, in terms of length, the, the kind of standard uh, best practice is somewhere between five to eight hundred words, something like that. No problem. Thank you very much for that. Um, and it does seem as if we have some questions coming through. Uh, firstly, is content marketing becoming more important than traditional marketing methods? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess it depends what you define as traditional marketing methods, but I, I think the short answer to that question is yes. Uh, I, Having said that, um, you know, content isn't really a new thing. Uh, I think it's got a new lease of life, and the way in which content's being used and distributed is being is quite different. And in the online world, there are lots of better ways that you can spread that content. But for example, if you know, I've done a lot of work over the years in the IT sector, and uh, you know, we were writing white papers and you know, implementation case studies and, you know, those types of things you know, 10, 15 years ago. So I don't, in that sense, I don't think content's necessarily a new tactic. It's just the way it's being used is quite different. And perhaps the key point is um, the way buyers make decisions is fundamentally shifting to self-serve. And therefore, content is becoming a much more important way of influencing them than it ever has in the past. Okay, thank you very much. And here's another interesting one. I was told that Google penalizes you for duplicate com 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 content. Sorry about that. Is it detrimental to repeat content in different locations? Um, so you're right. Um, pure content duplication is a problem, and uh, content uh, Google does not like it. And if you literally cut and paste let's say a blog post and publish that same blog post in multiple locations, uh, that's a bad thing, and you will get penalized for it. However, to answer the specific question, um, geolocated uh, content is fine. So Google actually doesn't mind that at all and in fact likes it. And you can, um, for example, publish a blog in Australia and New Zealand, and as long as it's geo, you put a little bit of snippet of code in there to make sure that Google understands that it's in New Zealand rather than Australia, they actually like that. Um, obviously, there's other ways you can take leverage a five to eight hundred word um, blog, for example, um, and without too much effort, ensure that it won't get dinged for duplicate content by, you know, changing the heading, making sure the keywords um, are changed up and, uh, you know, some of the, the content itself is, is changed around a bit. So you can, you can avoid a lot of the um, penalties that might come with that without too much effort, without losing, you know, having to rewrite the thing from scratch. Okay, thank you. And there's a part two to that question. How much content can you curate from a supplier site without having duplicate issues? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question exactly, but um, you know, our, our uh, advice is that um, curating content from um, a third party or a th um, is fine 
as long as you assign new um, attribution to the original author. So, for example, uh, we curate a lot of content on our own blog, and we like um, content that comes from uh, HubSpot, Marketing Profs, Marketing Sure. But these are all excellent organisations that we read their blogs and um, they have a lot of very interesting things to say. What I might do is I might take a Marketing Profs blog and say, you know, right up front, there's a really interesting Marketing Profs blog that I read called blah 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 blah, and it has a link in it, and it's written by this particular author, and then say, you know, the three the three points that I really took out of this were A, B, and C, and I think this means X, Y, and Z. So you can still curate content, um, and in a, you know, in a perfect world, it's not literally just cutting and pasting someone's content and, and bashing it out in your blog. It's saying what you think is interesting about that content and perhaps adding a, a, a thought or two of your own um, to that content. Okay, thank you. And we have another question here. What is... Oh, is I, I think it did, uh, but if the person who asked would like to quickly let me know if they were happy with that answer, I'll, I'll be sure to let you know. Um, so just moving on to another question. What is your advice for smaller print shops with regards to content marketing who do not have bigger financial resources compared to larger organizations? And just before you, you get to that, the, the person said, thank you, you answered the question really well. Oh, good. Okay. Um, yeah, look, I, I, I think I would... Um yeah, I'll be the first to acknowledge that that content marketing for for smaller organisations is is definitely a challenge. And um, yeah, I think I hope um, yeah, there are some suggestions in the slides for how to be smart about your content marketing. And I guess the the main point I would make is be really careful not to bite off more than you can chew and to overcommit. Um, I think if you if you plan it right up front. You think very carefully about who it is that you're trying to target, uh, and just start with a with a very focused campaign around um, the buyer persona you're trying to target. And uh, think carefully about if I put, let's say, I'm going to do, you know, two pieces of content a year. I'm going to put a lot of effort into getting those right. Um, hopefully, that's enough for for even the small organisations. They can they can resource that, and then think um, when you're designing that content piece very carefully about what we call the atomization of the content. When I mentioned that point in the, in the, in the presentation, what I was getting at was you know, thinking about how you can get you know, 10, 11, 12 pieces of content out of that one major content piece. So I think with you know, careful planning and that approach to atomization, you can, you can achieve a great deal. Second part of that is also carefully thinking about where am I going to share this content to get the biggest bang for my buck? So, the stats. One of the stats that was very, very early in the presentation was uh, two, uh, three quarters, I think, of organisations uh, share their content on LinkedIn. Um, LinkedIn groups. We didn't. I didn't mention explicitly, but that's an excellent way to distribute your content to a much wider audience than just your own personal network that you might have on LinkedIn. So you may find that you know you're, you're after a particular target audience in a particular sector. You can find half a dozen, maybe, uh, LinkedIn groups where the sort of people that you're trying to influence are members of that group. And posting interesting blogs, for example, that you've written that are born from your major content piece in those LinkedIn groups will get that content seen by far more people than they might otherwise have seen it. So I think with a little careful thinking and planning, you can often uh, achieve wonders, actually. Okay, thank you. And that seems to be it for all of the questions. So I guess we'll leave it there for today. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending. And hopefully we'll see you back on November 14th for our third um, topic about um, online marketing. Oh, and I've just got one more person who has said, thank you, excellent advice. So there's some more feedback for you, Chris. Thank you. No worries. Bye, everyone. See you soon. Thanks.